The obliteration of Carthage took place in 146 BC, the same year that Rome also destroyed the Greek city of Corinth. And together, these events symbolically mark the end of this initial phase of Roman expansion into the Eastern Mediterranean. During the sack of Carthage occurred an incident that nicely illustrates how Roman culture had already been changed by its exposure to Greek civilization. The Roman general, Scipio Aemilianus, was a member of the new generation of Romans who had been raised to appreciate Greek culture, being personally tutored by the Greek historian Polybius. And thus, as he watched Carthage burn to the ground, he was moved to recite in flawless Greek passages from Homer about the destruction of Troy. Here was the new Roman, just as brutal as ever, but now he recited fine poetry as he killed you. In their conquests in the West, Rome had gained territory, but in the East, where they conquered rich, heavily urbanized regions, for the first time they began to acquire truly enormous wealth. This money poured into the public treasury of the state, as well as into the pockets of the Roman generals, and to a lesser extent to their men. By 167 BC, so much income was flowing into Rome's coffers from the east that taxes were abolished for Roman citizens. And it's estimated that as a result of the eastern conquests, the revenue of the Roman state increased by a factor of six. Individual Romans, particularly the generals, became fabulously wealthy. For example, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, the victor of the Third Macedonian War, decided after that victory to reward his troops by turning them loose for one day and telling them that whatever they grabbed, they could keep. The enthusiastic soldiers managed to loot 70 Greek cities, in the process of which they grabbed 150,000 Greeks whom they sold into slavery. Lucius Aemilius Paulus didn't do so badly out of this campaign either. When he returned to Rome, he was given permission to celebrate a triumph. This was a special victory parade that was a much coveted reward afforded to successful generals. The day the triumph was to be held was declared a public holiday, and the returning general got to march through the city with his army and receive the cheers of the populace. Naturally, celebrating a triumph gained the general considerable dignitas. To qualify for a triumph, the general had to oversee a campaign in which at least 5,000 enemies were killed. In the triumph that Lucius Aemilius Paulus celebrated, not only did he march through Rome with his army, but he decided to put on display the booty that he had personally acquired during the campaign. This was such a vast amount of stuff that his triumph took three days. On the first day, 250 wagons rolled through the streets loaded with all the artworks that he had stolen while in Greece. On the second day, the crowds witnessed wagons bearing the weapons and armor of all the foreigners that his army had killed, followed by 2,250 talents of silver. The third and final day began with a parade of 231 talents of gold, followed by the golden plates and tableware of the defeated enemy king, followed by the golden crown of the enemy king, followed by the immediate family members of the enemy king, followed by the enemy king himself in chains marching before a golden chariot in which stood Lucius Aemilius Paulus himself, wrapped in a purple toga with a golden laurel wreath on his head. Roman imperialism created a vicious circle that ultimately made almost every segment of Roman society unhappy and resentful. Here's how it worked. The Roman army was supposed to be a militia of citizens serving short terms. But the reality is that constant wars forced people to serve long terms 
Service in the army was not open to all citizens, but rather only to those who met a certain wealth qualification, uh, which was usually achieved by owning land. Military service began to disrupt the economy, as men who had to leave their farms for such a long period of time often ended up losing the farms, since they were not there to maintain them. In addition, many poor people heard stories about the riches acquired by some soldiers, and so they voluntarily sold their farms in order to join the army with dreams of making their fortunes. While a few soldiers did come back fabulously wealthy, overwhelmingly the average legionary did not come home a rich man. Ultimately, Thousands of veterans returned to Italy after having served their country for many years without anything to show for it, and having lost their farms. Many of these veterans ended up flocking to the city of Rome in the hope of perhaps finding some form of employment, and they hung around in the city, bitter and idle. Partly due to this, the population of Rome exploded during this era, until it reached the phenomenal size of approximately one million people by the first century BC. An unfortunate long-term consequence of Roman imperialism, therefore, was the disruption and loss of small family farms. This was a serious problem if you keep in mind that the small-time family farmer, that soldier-citizen-farmer ideal exemplified by Cincinnatus, had been the backbone of Rome, which greatly contributed to its rise. Meanwhile, successful generals were returning to Italy with great wealth. But what could one do with such wealth? You can hoard it, but that doesn't do much for you. You can give it away. And many aristocrats did just this, sometimes building massive public works and donating them to the state to enhance their status. Uh, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, in fact, took this route and actually died broke. Finally, you could invest. But what is there to invest in? There was no stock market. You couldn't buy mutual funds or government bonds. There was, however, one thing that you could buy, land. And what do you know, just as many aristocrats loaded with cash were looking for land to buy, there were all these little family farms being sold or falling into debt and being auctioned off. So they bought them up. The completely unintended consequence was that the Italian countryside and the entire economy of Italy were profoundly changed from a vast number of tiny private family farms to a small number of gigantic plantation-like estates owned by just a few rich men. These plantations created a new problem, because such vast farms needed laborers to work them. But rather fortuitously for the owners, in addition to wealth, Roman imperialism was creating something else in vast quantities. Rome's wars were also causing hundreds of thousands of Easterners to be enslaved. Thus, there was a huge, cheap supply of labor available in the form of slaves captured in war. Many of these unfortunates found themselves sent to Italy to work the plantations. Roman imperialism had inadvertently created a huge cycle that fed upon itself. More wars produced more soldiers. More soldiers meant more farms being sold. Then the wars produced wealth and slaves, which were used to buy and run the farms. And each victorious war seemed to produce yet more wars, feeding back into the cycle. Rome was phenomenally successful in its imperialism. The problem was that these overseas successes, rather oddly, ended up making almost every group within Roman society embittered and deeply unhappy. The veterans were resentful because they felt that they had done their duty for the state 
but as a result had lost their farms, ended up homeless in the city, and had not been rewarded for their sacrifices. At the other end of the financial spectrum, many Roman aristocrats were also unhappy, in their case because all the wealth and dignitas from the wars was increasingly being monopolized by just a few men and families, such as the Scipios, and all the rest were left out. Another intensely unhappy, dissatisfied stratum of Roman society was the half-citizens and allies in Italy. These were the people who for centuries had been providing much of the manpower that enabled Rome to win its wars. These were the ones who had faithfully stayed loyal to Rome even in its darkest moments, such as when Hannibal was running amok. By the second century BC, they felt that they deserved to get full Roman citizenship and to share in the wealth of the conquests that they had made possible. In this, they were totally correct. They did deserve full citizenship and had amply earned it. The traditionally minded Romans, however, were reluctant to grant it and dragged their feet in extending Roman citizenship, with the result that the once loyal allies also became angry and embittered. Who else was unhappy? Well, there were the millions of slaves who had lost their freedom, been robbed, displaced from their homelands, and shipped off to Italy to work for the Romans. Obviously and justifiably, they were extremely resentful and unhappy. Finally, there were all the areas conquered by Rome, which had lost their independence and now labored under heavy tax burdens. Thus, Roman imperialism, for all its apparent success, had ultimately produced a huge, boiling cauldron of resentment, in which nearly every segment of Roman society was unhappy and harboring a grievance. Inevitably, all this resentment would boil over and explode, and when it did so, it would precipitate the destruction of the Roman Republic itself. Before we trace the disintegration of the Republic and the complex politics of this era, however, this is a good moment to pause and look at some of the other important but sometimes ignored groups in Roman society. After all, Roman history isn't just about famous politicians and generals, but includes slaves, women, and children as well. And we will look at their stories over the next several lectures.